Penguin Random House Audio presents Dare to Lead, Brave Work, Tough Conversations, Whole Hearts. This is the author, Brene Brown. A note from me. People often ask me if I still get nervous when I speak in public. The answer is yes. I'm always nervous. Experience keeps me from being scared, but I'm still nervous. First, People are offering me their most precious gift, their time. Time is, hands down, our most coveted, unrenewable resource. If being on the receiving end of one of life's most valuable gifts fails to leave you with a lump in your throat or butterflies in your stomach, then you're not paying attention. Second, speaking is vulnerable. I don't memorize my lines or have a set shtick that I do verbatim. Effective speaking is about the unpredictable and uncontrollable art of connection. Even though it's just me on stage and possibly 10,000 people sitting in folding chairs in a convention center, I try to look into as many pairs of eyes as I can. So yes, I'm always nervous. I have a couple of tricks that I've developed over the past several years that help me stay centered. Even though it makes event production teams crazy, I always ask for the house lights to be at 50%. When they're at 100%, you can't see the audience at all, and I don't like talking into the void. I need to see enough faces to know if we're in sync. Are the words and images pulling us together or pushing us apart? Are they recognizing their experiences in my stories? People make very specific faces when they're hearing something that rings true for them. They nod and smile and sometimes cover their faces with their hands. When it's not landing, I get the side tilt and less laughter. I have another trick I use when anxious event organizers try encouraging me to up my game by describing the status of the audience members. An organizer might say, hey, Brene, just so you know, the audience tonight includes top military brass. They'll mention the high-level corporate leaders, elite members of this or that special supergroup, the top glass ceiling breakers in the world, or my favorite. These actually are rocket scientists, Brene. They'll probably hate what you're saying, so stick to the data. This strategy is often employed when the audience seems somewhat resistant because they don't know why I'm there. Or, worst case scenario, they don't know why they have been forced to be there with me. In these cases, my strategy is a take on the classic picture the audience naked trick. Rather than picturing naked people sitting in auditorium chairs, which just doesn't work for me, I picture people without the armor of their titles, positions, power, or influence. When I spot the woman in the audience who has her lips pursed and her arms tightly folded across her chest, I picture what she looked like in the third grade. If I'm hooked by the guy who keeps shaking his head and making comments like, Winners aren't weak at work. I try to picture him holding a child or sitting with his therapist. Or honestly, sitting with the therapist I think he should see. Before I go on stage, I whisper the word people three or four times to myself. People, 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 people. This strategy was born out of desperation a decade ago, back in 2008, when I gave what I consider my first talk to a corporate leadership audience. I had lectured at Grand Rounds and hospitals and done many behavioral health talks. But the difference between those experiences and even just standing in that green room was palpable. I was trying to find a place to set up camp in a room with 20 other speakers, each of us waiting to be called to do our TED-style 20-minute talk at this day-long event, when that lonely feeling of not belonging and being out of place started washing over me. I first checked if it was a gender thing because to date, I'm often still the only female speaker backstage. But that wasn't it. It wasn't homesickness because I was 30 minutes from my house in Houston. When I heard the event organizers talking to the audience, I pulled back a small section of the heavy velvet curtains that separated the green room from the auditorium and peeked out. It was like a Brooks Brothers convention. Rows of mostly men in white shirts and very dark suits. I shut the curtain and started to panic. 
the guy standing close to me was a young, super energetic speaker who, you could tell, had never met a stranger. I'm not even sure what he was saying to me when I cut him off in mid-sentence. Oh my God, these are all business people, like executives or FBI agents. He chuckled, yeah, mate, it's a conference for sea levels didn't they tell you that? The blood drained out of my face as I slowly sat down on the empty chair next to me. He explained, you know, CEOs, COOs, CFOs, CMOs, CHROs. All I could think was, there is no way I'm going to tell this guy the truth. He knelt next to me and put his arm on my shoulder. You okay, mate? Maybe it was the Australian accent or the big smile or the name Pete that made this guy instantly trustworthy. But I turned to him and said, they did tell me it was a sea level audience. But I thought that meant down to earth. Like, these are real sea level people, salt of the earth, like sea level, S-E-A level. Through a huge booming laugh, he said, oh, that's brilliant. You should use that, man. I looked at him in the eye and said, it's not funny. I'm talking about shame and the danger of not believing we're enough. There was a long pause before I added, <laughs> ironically. By that time, a woman from Washington, D.C., who was doing her 20-minute talk on the oil trade, was standing beside us. She looked at me and said, shame? As in the emotion? Like, I'm ashamed? Before I could even admit that that was true, she said, huh, interesting, better you than me, and walked off. I'll never forget Pete's response. Look out into that audience again. These are people, just people and no one talks to them about shame, and every single one of them is in it up to their eyeballs, just like the rest of us. Look at them. They're people. I think either the truth of his advice or the thought of my topic got to him, because he stood up, squeezed my shoulder, and walked away. I quickly pulled out my laptop and searched popular MBA in business terms. I was thinking maybe I can put some hard corners on my topic by weaving in a little business lingo. Damn, it was like reading Old Hat, New Hat, the Berenstain Bears book that my kids loved when they were little. It's the story of Papa Bear going to the hat store and trying on 50 different hats to replace his old raggedy hat. But of course, all of the new hats have issues. Too loose, too tight, too heavy, too light. It goes on for pages until it reaches the logical conclusion of keeping the old ugly hat that fits perfectly. I started whispering some of the terms to myself to see if I could pull it off. Long pole item. No, too tall. Critical pathway. No, too trafficy. Skip level. No, too hopscotchy. Incentive. Maybe. Incentivize? Wait, what? I call bullshit. You can't just add eyes to stuff. Mercifully. My husband, Steve, called and interrupted my Berenstain Bears business search. How are you? Are you ready? He asked. No, it's a total cluster, I said. After I explained the situation, he was very quiet. Using his serious voice, the one reserved for panicked parents calling for medical advice, because he's a pediatrician, or for me when I'm losing my mind, he said, Brene, promise me that you will not use any of those dumbass words I mean it. I was near tears at this point. I whispered, I promise. But you should see these people, Steve. It's like a funeral and not a funeral in my family. It's not a fancy Wranglers and an appropriately somber cowboy hat funeral. It's like a British funeral or a graveside service on the Sopranos. He said, take that guy's advice and look out at the audience again. They're really just people like you and me like our friends. I mean, there are people there you know, right? These are real people with real lives and real problems. Do your thing. He told me he loved me and we hung up. I stood up and pulled the curtain back one more time. The room was darker and a speaker was talking from the stage. I wanted to see the audience members' faces, but my side view made it tough. Then, like a slow motion scene from a movie, a large, bald guy turned to whisper something to the guy sitting next to him, and I saw his face. I gasped and pulled the curtains closed. I know that guy. We got sober around the same time, and we used to go to the same AA meetings in the mid-90s. I could not believe it. 
As I sat there wondering if I was in the middle of a miracle, 